Dennis Grossell struggled against Clemson this weekend, but is he the right answer for Boston College moving forward this year? All of this and more on today's Locked On Boston College. You are Locked On Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Boston College. AJ Black, thank you all for listening. Today's show is brought to you by Rock Auto. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and tell them that Locked On sent you. On today's show, we are going to dive into a couple of questions that people have had. Uh, I want to look at Dennis Grossell as quarterback. We're going to also look at games from around the league. And also I'm going to give out some good, bad, and ugly stickers for Saturday's game against Clemson. Just as a programming note, we're going to conti- we're going to conclude our conversation on the Clemson game today. Rest of the week, we are going to dive into uh, the first half, basically the first third of the season, and give out some grades and talk about uh, some of the themes that have come up for that for the end of the week. So you'll want to check all of that out. So if you are on social media over the last few days, one of the things you've noticed is is that Dennis Grossell, who has taken over for Phil Dracovic at quarterback for Boston College, has become a very divisive figure among Boston College fans. Now, against Clemson, he made three mistakes, two or three turnovers. He made multiple mistakes on top of that. But on uh, he also had an interception against Missouri that was terrible. But He's also been their quarterback, and Jeff Halfley has thoroughly endorsed him as his quarterback. Now, I have to first of all admit that watching him can be kind of hard to watch at times. Sometimes he just struggles to make reads. He struggles to get the ball out in time. He doesn't look like he's very comfortable in the pocket. And those mistakes that he's made has almost cost Boston College two games now. Now, the question that fans have had, many of them are like, we got to bench Grossell. You got to put him on the bench. So my my question for you is, is Dennis Grossell the best option Boston College has? Now, the, the, the thought of many people is, well, you got other guys out there. You have Dalen Menard, Matt Weave, and Emmett Moorhead. You could just try one of them out and see if they're better. They have to be better than, than uh, Dennis Grossell. And for that, I say absolutely not. Because... Right now, Dennis Grossell is infuriating. I get that. He's played in it. He's played a ton of inconsistent football, and that's not helped. However, the thought that the next guy up is going to be better is is a logical fallacy, and here is why. So you have you have three guys: D- Dalen Menard, okay, who is he's got he's been around the program for a while. He's had he's been injured at times. He um, came from. Chaminade in Florida, so he's got good pedigree there. But if you listen to the coaching staff and have seen practices, I have to say he's not the level of what Grossell is. Now, what does that mean? So maybe he has a better arm than Grossell, because I know that's what people have been saying. But you're throwing out a guy that has not played an ounce of college football and hasn't started a game in three years into a game that means something, right? You know, you got to throw him against NC State. You, that defense is as good as Clemson. You throw Menard out there, and that could be tough. He could also do well, but I, I don't think it's going to, you know, he's a quarterback that was recruited by Steve Adazio. Say what you will about that, okay? Then you look at the other two guys. Matt Weave, I've heard he's doing okay, but he's raw. He's young. He was a late quarterback in the uh, 2020 recruiting class. He, he committed right after Halfley got in, like not even like January. So like he, he, he didn't have a ton of offers. I just don't see him as a guy that just you could throw in in his second year at BC. And he's a guy that it's going to take some seasoning. So you throw him out there against NC State, he's going to get killed because he's not – he, he hasn't had the, the college experience. So those two guys, there's your, what, what I think on both of them. And that's not a knock on either of them. Menard may be there, but I trust that Signetti and, and Halfley would make that assessment, and they've already made it by saying that they're going to stick with Grossell. Now, Moorhead, I think Moorhead out of all three has the highest upside. He's 6'5", he's giant with a cannon for an arm, but he's a true freshman. 
He is a true freshman, and I've heard um, from people who evaluated him and kind of watched him. He just needs some seasoning. He's he's he he needs time on campus. So these three quarterbacks, right? Yes, they're not Dennis Grossell, and many of them have um, better pedigrees, but they're not. They, I, I do not believe that any of those three guys are going to be a marked improvement over Grossell. Grossell has started, you know, 12 games, and yes, some of them have stunk, but he started and he's been good. He's played tough games. I mean, he just played against Brent Venable's defense and was able to keep them in a game. I know he made mistakes, but that just shows you where he's at. If you threw Matt Reeve or Emmett Moorhead against Brent Venable's defense in their first game, they would have been it would have been a disaster. So I always we talked about it on yesterday's show. The backup quarterback is the most popular guy on the roster. I don't think benching Dennis Grossell is going to do anything. You're just going to get yourself in a worse position to lose more games than you would if you took your chances with him. What you need to do is you need to program and scheme better around Grossell's ass Grossell's assets. You need to give you need to manage the playbook so he's doing quick releases. You know, you know, hitting guys in spots, not bombing, you know, uh, deep down and not holding on the ball so long. Like, yes, it was nice to see uh, Phil Dracovic do that. That's his style. Grossell really can't because he's getting killed out there when he does that. Uh, He needs to get rid of the ball. So I think that's kind of on Frank Signetti. And then another piece that kind of goes on to this like quarterback talk. So you want to create the scheme for Grossell. But other people are like, well, then why hasn't Jeff Halfley brought in a quarterback? Well, first of all, he has. He brought two in. I said one was a really late commitment because, you know, Jeff Halfley started late. And one is going to take time. He's not a blue chip quarterback that's coming in that needs it already. You have your choice of a guy that Steve Adazio committed or two youngsters. So that's not on Halfley. And you, and you can't get a transfer quarterback when you know a quarterback going into this season would have known he would have been third on the depth chart. And yeah, you could tell them that they're gonna they're gonna battle for a starting position, but everyone knows Phil Dracovic's gonna start. So they're not gonna come here. So there was nothing Halfley could have done to bring a quarterback in and basically tell them you're gonna be second or third team. It, that, that was just not an option for him. So I think Dennis Grossell's the answer. And he's not going to be the prettiest quarterback. He's not going to make the best throws all the time. But the thing that you got to hope for is that Signetti continues to to tailor that offense for his skill set. Maybe he sees things in the tape now. They're like, oh, I got to kind of adjust some of these plays because, you know, Grossell's going too deep and he doesn't have the arm for that. Um, I think that's that's the the best way that BC is going to be successful with Grossell's quarterback. And it's unfortunately not a dig at any of those other three guys. I don't think they're the answer right now. Now, in a moment... We're going to chat about our good, the bad, and the ugly heading into our bye week and talking about the Clemson game. But before we do that, I want to tell you about Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a leader in college sports daily fantasy. They offer more college football props than anyone in the world and offers all the star players of the Power Five, as well as mid major players you may not have ever heard of. Prize Picks offers any prop you can think of, from yardage to touchdowns and even interceptions thrown. And you can make mixed uh, sports bets too. So you could pick LeBron James and you could pick Patrice Bergeron. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can go in and make your bets. And it's easy to use. You can do it in 60 seconds or less. And when you make your first deposit, use promo code locked on and up to $100, they will match that. You're not going to beat that. Prize Picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals. Check out their app on the Google Store or in the Apple App Store. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com and use promo code locked on or go to your App Store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Are you in the process of doing work on your car? Why spend 30, 50, 70, or even 100% more by going to some of those chain stores when you can head to rockauto.com and save money? With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now possible for your local chain auto store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on the computer when you can do that yourself. Head over to rockauto.com and use their easy to use catalog. Just put in your make and model, boom, they'll tell you everything they have, whether it's tail lamps, brake parts, motor oil, or even new carpet. 
And when you head on over, go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Make sure to write locked on in their How'd You Hear Bus box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. Hello again, this is Locked On Boston College. I am your host, AJ Black. I'm also the editor and publisher of BC Bulletin. Check out my work there. It's part of the Sports Illustrated Fan Nation Network. If you are listening to this for the first time, I want to thank you, and I want to make sure that you make this part of your first listen every morning when you're either heading to work or doing a workout, whatever you're doing, making Locked On Boston College part of your daily routine. Much appreciated, and we thank you. Now, we're going to wrap up our conversation on Clemson. It was a depressing loss, and I know a lot of BC fans are, are reacting tough. I, I, total side note here, I saw actually great pictures at something BC did for a fan um, watch for students. They actually opened up Alumni Stadium and showed the game on the Jumbotron, and there were a ton of BC students at that gathering. That was great. I've never seen anything like that recently, so uh, – Kudos to BC for doing that. Now, this is our segment. We're going to call it Good, Bad, and Ugly, where I'm going to give out a good, bad, and ugly sticker for uh, different players in or different events that happened during the BC Clemson game. We're going to try to do these every Tuesday now during the season. I have two good stickers to give out today. We're going to get, we're going to stay positive, and I want to give out two. The first one is going to go to the secondary. I thought the secondary on Saturday played the best game I've seen them play under Jeff Halfley. Uh, they were just dynamic, and I think part of that was, you know, they were playing violent, as Halfley said after the game. They played with great technique. They were right on those receivers, and they made it to the point where Clemson's wide receivers, who, you know, Joseph Nagata and some of their other guys that they had, uh, didn't seem all that interested in trying to fight for some of those catches, and that was on the defense because, Brandon Sebastian, Josh DeBerry, Elijah Jones, even some of the safeties, I thought, did a nice job of really making it hard on every catch. Uh, so a sticker goes out to the secondary for their play. The other good sticker is going to go to Grant Carlson, who silently has put together a heck of a season. And, you know, you don't want to ever talk about a punter and, you, you know, you, you think of a, a season going awry if a punter is in the conversation for having a good season. But Grant Carlson is doing it at a level that helps Boston College because he flips the field constantly. He did it over and over again on Saturday. I, I mean, Sunday, Saturday, excuse me. He had a 72-yard punt his season long. He was pinning... Clemson inside the 20 on a consistent basis. And he's done this game after game now. Now, when I talked to Mitch Wolf earlier on in the preseason, I asked him, I said, hey, Mitch, you know, is Grant Carlson a possible draft pick? He said, nah, he doesn't have a big enough kick. But, you know, man, he is really starting to show up now. And he's playing at a level that should get him in the conversation for the Ray Guy watch list. I know he wasn't in it to begin the season, but he's playing very, very well. And he's become a huge asset for Boston College. If you've got a punter that can do what he does, that could make your team even better. Because you're you're pinning defense uh, opposing offenses in impossible situations a lot. And that's what BC did against Clemson. Now, the bad sticker is going to go to the penalties and mistakes. BC made 10 penalties in Saturday's game. Many of them were pre snap dumb, boneheaded plays that we've seen BC do in the past. And there were drives just completely stalled by false starts, illegal formations. There was like one phase where BC got nailed for like three illegal formation calls, you know, guys in the backfield, things like that. That kind of stuff needs to be cleaned up. And you can you, you definitely can rip on the players, but the legal formation thing, I mean, that's kind of on Jeff Halfley to kind of fix all that. So hopefully the coaching staff will do that because there was another game earlier this season against UMass where BC's penalties uh, really bit them. And then for two straight games after that against Missouri and Temple, BC really cleaned up those penalties. But that was one piece of the of sloppiness. The other piece was the turnovers. Obviously, we've talked about Dennis Grossell and his two, two interceptions and the fumble. That you, if you're going to have a minus three turnover ratio, you're not going to win many games. It's just not going to happen because that's just the way it works. And Boston College was there. So these this sloppiness was the bad. And the ugly, that's going to go to the ACC refs. Now, Jeff Halfley couldn't bash him. Dabo Sweeney clearly did. But I'm not even going to say it was against BC for everything because... You know, there was the hit to the head against Dennis Grossell that was garbage, and that would have helped Boston co uh, help that helped Boston College. So it wasn't just BC getting hammered for for bad penalties, but it just it was just the officiating in general. It was just 
sporadic. There was the clearly the play with Andrew Booth where he danced in front of the defensive lineman and the most egregious offsides play I've ever seen that was never called. There was, you know, there was calls against B, uh, against Clemson or not calls against BC that I thought were not called too. There was a couple times, and I think Dabo brought it up where uh, Cle- BC looked like they were jumping a little early on their off their snap count. So I just thought the refs really kind of took a lot out of that game. I mean, the the Andrew Booth um, non call offsides. You need to look at the whole picture of what that did. It was third and two. Boston College, we don't know what the play was because Grossell audibled out of it and just what tried to, he was going to go for a big play because he knew he, the guy was offside. I mean, Booth was offsides. Third and two around the 50. If, you know, he's going offsides, that's an automatic first down. Instead, he's, Grossell is sacked for 12 yards. They're pulled out of field goal position. They're out of going in for a fourth down. They have to punt the ball. That is an inexcusable bad officiating call. As bad and and as I said, the the blow to the the blow to the head call against Clemson for the sack on Grossell was also inexcusable too. So the ugly goes to officiating, and I can rip them all I want because I'm a broadcaster and I'm not a coach. It was bad, and I think if if you looked around the league, it was just a bad weekend for officiating because the Louisville game. That came down to a bad kick. I mean, a bad call. You know, there was all sorts of just nasty bad calls by the officiating. So you hate seeing that because you'd rather just see the games won and lost by the players. And it didn't seem like that against Clemson and BC. Now, in a moment, we'll be joined by Mitch Wolf, and we're going to jump around and look at college football games from around the country. And we're back and better than ever. All eyes are on the gridiron as teams are back for another football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season with a new updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit when you use co- promo code LOCKED ON. From basketball, football, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for you for the 2021 season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. BetOnline, where the game starts. This is Locked On Boston College. Happy Tuesday, everyone. With me again, I have Mitch Wolf. Mitch, how's it going? It's good. You know, we it was a rough weekend, but, you know, as I said to a friend of mine who's, I believe, is also a listener to the podcast, you know, Schadenfreude is a powerful drug, and we're going to go through a little bit of that today. I have to admit, so we're going to get into games from around the country. You know, during college football season, a lot of times my whole day is just like, you know, watching football. I, I could be doing things around the house, have the games on my phone. I'm always busy. But I have to say this weekend, I jammed so much fall into my weekend that I didn't get other than the BC game. I don't think I watched anything. I listen to this Mitch this weekend. I went apple picking pumpkin uh, picking. I went on a hay ride. We did dinner and there was one more freaking thing I did. So oh, I we think did you... oh, we did like a touch a truck thing. So I did like 15 things in two days. Like all say, like... That's like, that, that's like the Mount Rushmore of fall activities with the, <laughs> I mean, I went to a farmer's market, so that's probably the other one, but you know, oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, there was like a a market there. We ended up with there. You go. Of okay, so yeah, you got them all. So busy, but I I still kept kept track of some of the games this weekend. Um, and the ACC as uh, on locked on ACC, I talked a lot about how exciting some of these games were going to be. And if you went to BC Bulletin and looked at my spread picks and you gambled on them, you're probably broke by now because <laughs> I tanked hard on this. Now, some of the games that I looked at, I thought, hey, you know. This is going to be a big one. Uh, the first one that I, I completely whiffed on was Florida State and Syracuse because I thought Syracuse was going to be – I thought they had their team turned around, and they completely whiffed against Florida State. Did you watch any of that game? I caught the end of that one too. And, like, I, I saw some of the plays on Twitter as some of the other games were finishing up, and I you, know, you saw the uh, – it was like a, some kind of, like, fumble that turned into a touchdown for Florida yep. State. You know, all kinds of just craziness going on, which I was like, okay, I got to see the end of this. And – you know, I, I I do kind of feel bad for Florida State at this point that I was kind of like happy to see them get the win just because it's like, OK, like they finally got something at least. Yeah, it's hard to really root for Florida State. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't like rooting for Syracuse either, though. So that was that was kind yeah. of like the middle. But then well, I think the biggest story in the ACC right now has to be Wake Forest, which 
completely. I mean, I thought they were going to be good this year, and, but good, like, you know, seven wins good, but they're playing really, really well. And Sam Hartman seems to be one of the best quarterbacks in the ACC, which completely blew my mind. Uh, they, they, they took down Louisville in a game where I believe it was halftime where there was a kick that Scott Satterfield did not get off. Um, yes. Something like that. Yes. And it actually might've been the other way around. I think, I think no. So, so Louisville, so wake forest uh, got stopped with like a second left and they were, they, so they, they got the timeout off quote unquote, and they were able to kick an extra field goal to uh, I think, take the lead into halftime. Gotcha. Well, wake forest, are they going to win the ACC Atlantic? I mean, it's very possible. I mean, so they've had an extremely easy schedule thus far. Like, and I think they still have to play army and, you know, the, the, the service academies are always tough just because the option presents its own issues, but they should be able to win that. But I mean, they've got Syracuse next week by week. They've got a bye week going into army. So that's huge for them. Then Duke and, and their, their last four games are really tough. So they could be, let's see, that's uh it could be like nine and oh or eight and oh going into their final four games, which are at UNC versus NC state at Clemson and at BC. So three road trips, you know, two of the best teams in terms of just talent in the ACC, another team that's in the top 25 and then have to go up to BC at the end of November. So, you know, they could be nine and oh going into those into, into November, but they've got some uh, heavy or some hard roads to truck at the end of the season. And uh, uh, good continuing in uh, we'll, we'll switch co- uh, divisions here and look at the, the coastal and where I completely whiffed on. Uh, I, I thought I, after Georgia tech annihilated UNC last week, I was like, okay, this team, I thought they were going in the right direction. I thought Jeff Collins had his quarterback. I thought they were going to get, you know, find their rhythm this year. And nope, they go out there and get absolutely blasted by Pitt, 52 to 21 in a game where Georgia tech, faithful is already talking about Jeff Collins head again. What is your thought about that game? Cause that game completely blew my mind. My, my thought is that Kenny Pickett might be the best quarterback in the ACC. I mean, he's having an absolutely incredible year and granted some of it was against mediocre opponents, but I mean, he's just lighting it up. You know, a lot of people in draft Twitter circles are, you know, getting really high on pick, you know, he's a really tough player. He's, you know, despite being not like a huge guy, he's got a really strong arm ability to throw all over the field. He's, uh, you know, decently athletic, you know, can make a lot of plays for you. So a lot of people are really high on Kenny Pickett right now. And I think that, you know, I think Pitt's got a decent chance to win the ACC coastal, you know, UNC's had their missteps. So I think Pitt's in the driver's seat right now. Interesting. Yeah. Their defense looked really good and Pickett mm-hmm. obviously is looking really good. So let's, let's jump out of the ACC for a second. Um, quickly, uh, our friend, Anthony Brown, I saw you tweet about it. Um, bad Anthony <laughs> Brown came back out again. Um, yeah. and as they lost to Stanford, correct? Yeah. And over time, I caught the end of that. And, you know, we talked about Dabo and his problems with the officials in the BC Clemson game, but man, the, the Pac-12 officials in the Oregon Stanford game were something else, just terrible targetings, roughing the pass. There's a, a terrible phantom offensive or defensive pass interference, at the end of regulation that just keep, kept giving Stanford opportunities. And it, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> All right, so well, let's 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 get to bad football. Uh, it's our favorite part of the segment of our show, which is uh, what's going on with UMass and UConn football. All right, so UConn, let's 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 kick it off with that because they had the more interesting matchup because this was a matchup between UConn and Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is one of the worst teams in a Power Five conference. They did beat mm-hmm. Daz a couple weeks ago. Uh, now mm-hmm. they had their chance against UConn and. Credit to the Huskies. They almost won this game. Uh, Mitch, what did you find out about the Huskies in this one? Yeah, I mean, the Huskies have been a covering machine the last few weeks. You know, taking Vanderbilt down to the wire, a team that's only win is on a last-second field goal against Steve Adazio, gets her second win on a last-second field goal against UConn. So, you know, I think at the end of the, on uh, Vandy's final drive, they were gifted a pretty significant pass interference call, which I thought was pretty legit. Some people didn't, but that kind of sealed the game for the Commodores. And, you know, the season of futility – for UConn continues, but you know, we'll, we'll reach the true depths, the abyss of football futility in this upcoming week. And then UMass, I, I, you know, I gave them a lot of credit when they battled against BC and I know a lot of the, the points that they got were BC self-inflicted wounds. Uh, they did not, <laughs> they went out there no. and got trounced by Toledo 45, seven. 
Yeah, they've uh, had two back-to-back really bad games, getting absolutely uh, blitzkrieged by Coastal Carolina last week too. So it's uh, uh, any optimism for the Minutemen has quickly faded away. So, the, you know, we 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 bash on them this week, uh, but BC's off, and there's one marquee Power Five Northeast game this weekend, and it's UMass and UConn. I had to say a couple of weeks ago, I, I was again, right after BC beat UMass, I was like, I think UMass is going to beat UConn, but the way UConn has been playing recently, I think they might beat UMass. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really excited for some really bad football um, and errors and sloppy crap. I just can't wait to see terrible football. Is this game even going to be on TV? I have to look that up. I, that's what I'm looking for right now. It doesn't, it doesn't say on ESPN, but that might be taking a little bit. Um, I would imagine it might be on that Flow Flow sports, sports network. Yeah. It's at, it's at a uh, Warren McGurk at UMass. So it's probably gonna be on that fun. Yeah, it's on Flow again. Sports. Oh, great. <laughs> so um, I don't know how much you hate UMass and UConn. If you want to spend the, whatever it costs for a month of flow sports, um, you could do that. Otherwise just look online and see if you can find clips of it. Um, yeah, I mean, Mitch, somebody's got, somebody's got to get a win here. That's the, I mean, that's the beauty of it. Somebody is going to have their first win of the season in this game, which is always yeah. fun. I, who is it going to be? Who are you going to, who would you, if you were a betting man, who would you bet on this one? Well, so it's interesting. So I'm looking at ESPN's matchup predictors and stuff. So they give Matt UMass a 62% chance of winning, but apparently UConn is favored by two right now. And the overrunner is 55. So, you know, I think it's interesting because I think, you know, we kind of ragged on UConn for all their stuff. And I think now they're kind of playing as the team with nothing to lose. I mean, obviously they can lose games, but like they, they're kind of at rock bottom. So it's just like, well, you know, what else can we do? We'll just go out there and, you know, give it our all and we'll see what happens. You know, they almost had Vanderbilt. I think if they can keep that going, they should beat UMass. But, you know, it is UConn. It could go the other way. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I, I think that they have the momentum right now. I thought... UMass had it for a little bit and then they lost it. So, ooh, yeah, like, teams. I don't know, like, I don't know, like UMass could be kind of getting there too, after getting just absolutely destroyed the last two weeks. Whereas UConn, you know, so like UMass might have the momentum in that they're like, okay, listen, we're just going to go out there and, you know, we have nothing to lose, go crazy. Whereas UConn might be kind of coming down after two emotional close losses. So, you know, there's, I don't think there's really any good way to predict who's going to win this game. Honestly, like if I really hope this just keeps going into overtimes and just gets absolutely nuts. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for craziness here and I can't wait to hear about it, but we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Mitch, where can people find you on uh, social media? You can find me at Mitchell T. Wolf on Twitter, W-O-L-F-E. Again, posting the BC links uh, for my articles there. Um, I think we're going to try to get some different articles going out for this bye week uh, time where we can have a little more time to digest some film, you know, look into some stats and, you know, try to find what BC is going to be doing for the rest of the season. All right. Thanks, Mitch. Have a good one. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to Locked On Boston College. Again, I appreciate all of you that have made Boston College, uh, Locked On Boston College, your first listen every morning. We had our biggest week ever last week, and I want to continue to build our audience, and you are so valuable. Thank you all, and we'll see you again soon. Take care, everyone.